I'm going to talk about the rise of Jeremy Corbyn, why it happened, I think I know why it happened, and what might happen next, and try and put it into some kind of context as well. We'll go back to the New Labour period, certainly the end of the New Labour period, and reflect a bit on media commentary. Um, but before I do that, I want to make two observations as a political journalist. Some of you are academics. And the first one is this, that I've always had the view that one of the big mistakes the media makes about politics is that we as commentators are always calling on politicians to do this or that without thinking that if they did this or that, their next statement would be to announce their resignation. Um, in other words, we in the media, and this is true of the BBC and broadcasters too, assume that political leaders are mighty figures, that those who dissent from the leadership are almost as mighty, so that's why John Humphreys gives them a hard time. Whereas I've always had a theory, which I've never felt for one moment to reverse, that most of the time, our political leaders, and incidentally that includes Cameron and Osborne in apparently commanding positions now, operate on a crowded political stage where they have very little room for manoeuvre. And the great geniuses find the space on the crowded stage. Many are knocked over and find they really can't do very much at all. And I make that general observation to then make a specific observation about the current situation. I have never in my journalistic career seen a situation where Corbyn and his dissenters are both trapped to the point where neither, it seems to me, have room to move. It is the oddest situation I've come across in my time following British politics. In other words, wholly unexpected to him and to the Labour Party until the leadership contest, Jeremy Corbyn finds himself having been an impotent backbencher through choice, with theoretical power to die for, a landslide victory in a leadership contest that no one at the beginning expected him to win. And at this moment of great titanic triumph, he suddenly finds himself trapped. Here he is, a figure who has opposed triumph all his life, whenever it became sensitive politically, now in agonised contortions about what to say on Trident because of his parliamentary Labour Party taking a different view. Corbyn is liberated by the membership and the mandate that he got in that election, but is trapped by the fact that his Labour parliamentary party, on the whole, oppose him and are already plotting to remove him. But that parliamentary Labour party, the dissenting wing of it, is as trapped as Jeremy Corbyn. They cannot claim to stand and represent the membership of their party as they dissent. The membership only a month ago endorsed the leader they oppose. So what do they do? The answer is they are not at all sure. They know for sure they want to remove Jeremy Corbyn. They are convinced, right or wrongly, we can discuss, that Labour will lose an election unless they move fairly soon but they do not know who, or how, or what really they would replace him with in terms of an alternative ideology. I mean, one other observation before I sort of explore why this has happened, and that is this. I find in British politics that whatever we think is happening, almost always the reverse is closer to the truth. That's my polite way of saying the media commentaria are nearly always wrong. Um, so, for example, at the moment, the orthodoxy in the media is that Cameron and Osborne are commanding and already have won the next election, and that this whole process, this extraordinary story, is an unequivocal, the Corbyn story, catastrophe. My instinct is to assume that must be wrong. 
because the commentariat are always wrong. I'll give you an example. In 2010, if we were sitting here, this autumn in 2010, and you had a commentator here, he or she would have said to you, this coalition is transforming British politics. It's quite clear that voters love coalitions. We're going to get loads more of them. <coughs> Probably a realignment with the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. That's what the commentators were saying in the autumn of 2010. And at that very time, as they were hailing the relationship between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, Clegg, in particular, had taken decisions that were going to lead to his terrible, dark fate in May of this year. But we didn't see them because we assumed a certain orthodoxy, and we all try and think together. In 1997, when Tony Blair was elected, read the commentary, hail this great reforming radical prime minister, when in reality, in front of his, our eyes, he was being cautious and defensive and nervy and reviewing everything to the point where even he now admits he was being cautious, defensive and nervy. But the in thing at the time was to assume this great radical prime minister had been elected, partly because he told us he was a great radical <laughs> prime minister. So we are always wrong. So I start from the assumption that the current popular narrative that the rise of Corbyn is a total catastrophe and that Cameron and Osborne are overwhelmingly dominant is in some respects at least wrong. So, what happened and why? I think that one of the misreadings of the current situation, it's one advocated noisily on Twitter by some of the so-called Blairites, a definition, by the way, which is now so ill-defined and vague, I don't really accept it, but you know what I mean, who on Twitter are saying that all those who in any way at all was attracted to the whole Corbyn phenomenon this summer aren't interested in winning elections. And all those who turn their back on New Labour are indifferent to winning elections. I don't think that is the reason why there is now some disillusionment with New Labour. I think the reason why there is disillusionment with New Labour is not because they won elections. That would be totally perverse. If you actually reverse it and say, well, I thoroughly enjoy politics when I lose elections, I mean, you have to be off your head to follow that thesis. The reason why there is a sort of traumatic the thing hovering over that period is the way it ended. Not the election victories, but the end. Which had the ingredients of a Shakespearean tragedy. There would be many dramas done about Blair and Brown, but I don't think they captured the degree to which the ending was a Shakespearean tragedy. Blair and Brown, as you know, ached to be popular. They had lived through the 80s and the trauma of those defeats and incidentally some of the issues that are arising now about whether MPs should be deselected and all this. And so they turned everything on its head. And Brown, who was a sort of stealthy social democrat, assumed that the only way he could, through stealth, introduce social democratic policies was to be associated at all times with the respectable figures in Britain the bankers, the city of London. And so Brown went out of his way, not because he was especially interested in the bankers or the city of London, he wasn't, they weren't his kind of people, but in order to do what he obsessed him, addressing issues to do with inequality, he felt he needed a protective shield. And he chose the bankers and the city of London, and they turned on him. And the fall of Brown is associated with photographs of him opening American banks in London, his very light regulatory touch on the city of London. He did that in order to be popular, and it brought about his downfall. Tony Blair in the 1980s witnessed the humiliation of Neil Kinnock as leader of the opposition when he went to see Ronald Reagan, the President of the United States. Reagan, who adored Thatcher, gave Kinnock 10 minutes and didn't recognize Kinnock's shadow foreign secretary, Dennis Healy, mistook him for some ambassador elsewhere. Um, Blair thought this should not happen to a Labour leader. 
Blair saw Thatcher idolise when she went to the White House and thought this has got to be the role for a Labour Prime Minister. And Blair, in his mind, thought that respectability for a Labour Prime Minister is to always be an unswerving ally of the United States President. And he felt that even more strongly when the United States elected a Republican president. He said to a departing cabinet minister when Bush was elected, I'm going to show I can work with him and be as close to him as he had done in Smith, the then conservative leader who was very close to the Republican Party in America. And so when the Iraq conundrum arose for Blair, he thought...